The Lord be with you, brothers and sisters in Christ. Our worship service this morning is Divine Service Setting 4 on page 203. Uh, we're going to, because there's so much standing, we technically don't need to stand for the opening hymn, so I thought today <clears throat> we would sit, actually no, this is a praise hymn. Talk to me downstairs about your thoughts about sitting normally for the opening hymn. A lot of churches do this, and I know there's just a lot of standing in the beginning part of the service, but this is a good praise hymn, so we should stand to sing this one. But let's stand to sing hymn 790. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Our help is in the name of the Lord. <clears throat> if you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise. <clears throat> and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness, 
and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. To God, have mercy on us. Almighty God in his mercy <clears throat> has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Clap your hands all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. He subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with the psalm. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, whose never-failing providence orders all things, both in heaven and earth, we humbly implore you to put away from us all hurtful things and to give us those things that are profitable for us. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament reading for the seventh Sunday after Trinity is from Genesis chapter 2. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground 
and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man and the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land, Ahavala, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Bedellion and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east to Assyria, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. This is the word of the Lord. Now, the, the, okay. our second reading is from the epistle of Romans, chapter 6. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For, ju for, as you just, for just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. Slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of these things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruits you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 8th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. <clears throat> In those days, when again a great crowd had gathered, and they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd, because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered him, How can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he asked them, How many loaves do you have? They said, Seven. And he directed the crowds to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And they set them before the crowd. And they had a few small fish. And having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied. And they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. And there were about 4,000 people. And he sent them away. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ, the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, <clears throat> maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, 
being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. I welcome you this morning to Zion Evangelical Lutheran Church. Please remember to fill out the fellowship pads and have your pews and pass them to Lee. It's how he gets to know who's worshiping with us uh, this morning. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Uh, number one, we have a voters meeting next Sunday in between services. Uh, Reverend Paul Nuss will also be conduct conducting those services as I will be at uh, the 68th uh, Synod Convention for the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod in Milwaukee. Um, August 12th is our Second Annual Ohio Winkle for Laity. Uh, you can read more about an insert. Also, go to the website. Make sure you register at uh, registerforall at gmail.com. And also, if you want to get more information on who's presenting and their topics, uh, you can go to Zion's website, and there's a tab that has all that explained. Uh, last announcement, uh, two more announcements, but they both pertain to the same thing. Uh, number one, of course, we welcome our uh, new vicar. A little different this year. Normally, the vicar's first day is the first Sunday that they're here, um, but due to scheduling stuff, we had the vicar with us uh, all week long, which is why he's participating in the service this morning before the installation. Um, so we welcome him, come downstairs, get to know him a little more in between services. We'll have a reception for him and his family. And the second thing is um, we, the installation is before the prayer of the church. And I was telling him, we always install people before the prayers, um, particularly because once you install somebody, then, you know, you either pray for them, as we did for all the board members, um, or, in this case, as one who is in the Lord's house to serve the Lord, um, his first pastoral act, so to speak, um, even though he's not a pastor, he's a vicar, of course, um, is to pray on behalf of the church and for the church. Um, and what's interesting is that this is the same thing even at ordinations. Um, the difference between the vicarage installation and an ordination is that for vicars, they do the prayer of the church, and then the pastor comes and administers the sacrament, whereas at an ordination, pray the prayer of the church, and then the new pastor gets to administer the sacrament for the first time. But just always like to bring that up and remind why we do things in the liturgy the way we do them. So again, um, just to, so everyone knows, the installation of the vicar will be before the prayer of the church, and then he will lead us in the prayers. With that, we will now continue with the hymn of the day, 819.
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We hear these words of Jesus again from the Gospel reading where Jesus feeds the 4,000, Mark 8, verse 2. I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. So far, the word of the Lord. <coughs> Everyone likes compassionate Jesus. Compassionate Jesus is easy to stomach. Everyone likes compassionate pastors. Compassionate pastors are easy to stomach. The question I'd like you to consider from today's gospel reading is when is Jesus compassionate? Also consider the rest of scripture. Is he always compassionate? That is to say, is compassion an attribute of God or just an occasional occurrence? Should pastors always be compassionate, or is there a time when they should not be? Let's first consider what compassion means. The word's etymology is to share in suffering. Christ's passion is the account of his suffering for us. One who has compassion, though, is someone who shares in the suffering of another, for example, a grieving widow. Maybe it means crying with her. The apostle says, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Any man here who thinks it's more masculine not to cry is an utter fool. Jesus wept when Lazarus died, perhaps more telling, Jesus wept over the city of Jerusalem upon his triumphal entry because his own people, quote, did not know the time of their visitation. Jesus wept because his own people did not recognize God's coming in the flesh to his people. The Savior of the world was there, and yet the world did not know him, and his own people did not receive him. The world saw Jesus as weak. Yet Jesus is the most masculine man ever to walk the face of this earth because the most defining characteristic of a man is sacrifice. Jesus paid a bigger sacrifice than anyone ever even could. He was crucified for the sins of everyone, past, present, and future, and yet himself was without sin. That is the meaning of the steadfast love that you so often read in the New Old Testament. He suffered to the point of death only for the sake of obedience to his Father and out of his love for you. He passioned for you. Having compassion for someone else, though, means putting yourself on their emotional plane. That is to say, maybe you don't shed tears, every time, but your guts tear up inside, sharing the sentiment of the person who is suffering. The Greek word for compassion is splognizomai, which sounds just as yucky as its literal meaning. The image of the word conveys having your guts sacrificed. It's the feeling that we would describe as sick to your stomach or having your heart ripped out, to have your guts sacrificed. It's a stark image, isn't it? It is interesting, then, that the only person who has this sort of compassion in the Bible is the God who passioned, that is, suffered for us. No human beings are ever the ones who have this gut sacrifice. They do, however, receive God's compassion. There are three instances where either Jesus himself or the God figure in a parable has compassion. Besides today's gospel reading where Jesus feeds the 4,000, there is also the father in the prodigal son account. The father has compassion when he sees his wayward, repentant son returning to him. There is also the king in the parable of the unforgiving servant who has compassion on the servant who owed him 200,000 years worth of wages. To the VBS kids that were in my class this past week, I accidentally told you guys that 
The guy only owed 200 years worth of wages. Of course, my memory is faulty. I was three zeros short. What compassion a king must have to forgive a debt that would take 200,000 years of paychecks to repay. But what do these three accounts teach us about God's compassion? First, in the parable of the prodigal son, the father doesn't have compassion until the son returns home. The son had planned to say to his father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Yet while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced and kissed him. You see, humility and repentance preceded the father's compassion. Second, in the parable of the unforgiving servant in Matthew 18, the king's master ordered the servant to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and payments to be made. It was the just punishment for such an outlandish debt. Yet in similar humility, the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. Now this was impossible, But his petition for the master's patience caused the master to have pity for him, which is the same Greek word that we have been talking about today, gut, sacrifice. You see again, humility and repentance preceded the master's compassion. But in addition, it also took faith, that is trust, for the servant to think that such a plea might even be heard let alone granted. Third and finally, we have today's gospel reading. The people were hanging on to Jesus' every word for three straight days. Now, three straight days of catechesis may seem to suggest that revivals are the way to go. You know, those worship services that go day after day and night after night. I will tell you that personally, my problem with these ongoing revivals, is that it causes Christians to neglect their other vocations. Imagine if the vicar and I taught alternately three straight days of Bible study or led three straight days of worship, just merely taking naps and eating in between. How would our wives take that? How fair would that be to our children? So this gospel reading is not intended to commend the sort of thing that took place, for example, in Kentucky this past winter. But it does show how much people loved God's word. More importantly, it shows how Christ has compassion for those who love God's word. Jesus acknowledges the dire straits these people are in. He says, if I send them away, hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from far away. You see, Jesus cares not only about the people's spiritual well-being, he also cares about their physical well-being. He wants to feed them, spiritually and bodily. The two are never separated in this life. This is why in the dismissal blessing after receiving the sacrament, you hear, now this body and this blood strengthen and preserve you in both body and soul unto life everlasting. So also Christ not only cares about the body and souls of those 4,000 people, he also cares about your body and soul. But the important thing to remember is that God has compassion when he sees humility, repentance, and faith. When we confess that we are poor, miserable sinners, spiritually impoverished, and in great need of his mercy, We are struck with contrition, true sorrow for sin. In this sense, we are the prodigal son. And then when we realize the magnitude of our debt of sin that we can never repay in this lifetime or 2,000 lifetimes, we beg for mercy and confess we are the servants who need our debts forgiven, erased. And in our plea for mercy and God's patience, he is once again compassionate 
and forgives our debt for Jesus' sake. Finally, we learn that we need to continually be taught by Jesus. Day after day, we read his word. We come to hear his word taught and preached. Just said this to our older kids during VBS this past week. Most of them in our older group had already been confirmed. And of course, one of the common ways of thinking in our culture is that once you get confirmed, that's sort of like a graduation of the Christian faith, Christian discipleship. But confirmation is the entrance into communication. I'm sorry, into communicant membership of the Christian church. You get there, you get confirmed, you are committing to learning about Jesus for the rest of your life. So week after week, we receive that word corporately with our dear brothers and sisters in Christ. That's why we gather together in church to receive his gifts. Now, just as Jesus did this in a desolate place in Mark, Christ, in his great compassion, provides a miraculous meal for you wherever two or more are gathered in his name. Though it be not bread and fish, it is bread and wine, and also his very body and blood. So repent of your sins, seek his mercy, and receive the forgiveness of sins that he generously portions out for you. But hear this warning. Do not expect your God to show compassion if you stubbornly resist his word. He does not have compassion for those who wish to heap up excuses for their sins. He does not show compassion for those who choose to live in their sins in unrepentance. And this is why your pastor is not to show compassion for those who resist the forgiveness of sins that Christ freely offers. Because those who choose to willfully live in their sin choose to gloat in their sin. Gloating is not suffering. Remember, to have compassion requires a person to share in suffering, not gloating or boasting or complacency or apathy. But you see, when you confess your sins and admit, I am sorry for this, I want to do better, I ask for your grace to the Heavenly Father. Not only your pastor, but God himself hears your confession. And along with the angels in heaven rejoices over one sinner who repents, as the parable of the lost sheep teaches. So repent and believe God's word that where there is repentance, there is more joy before the angels of God in heaven. It is a lie of the devil that tempts us to believe that when we repent, there is great shame. No, there is great joy. Read the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin in Luke 15 and tell me what I said is not true. If you want God to be compassionate towards you, have the humility of repentance. Faith that trusts he will hear your prayers for mercy and that he has forgiven your debt in Christ Jesus. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Come here and learn his word. Hear his word at church weekly. Hear his word at home daily. God will be compassionate to you for Jesus' sake. It is his great desire to be compassionate. He shared in your suffering when he endured the cross and grave. Your pastor will imitate the Lord's compassion too, to the best of his ability, and so also should your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, as we bear one another's burdens. In Jesus' name, amen. And now the peace of God which transcends all understanding, guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We sing hymn 956.
Congregation may be seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, according to the usual custom of the church, Alex Hinojosa has been assigned to Zion Evangelical Lutheran Church as a vicar. As a student assigned to our congregation, he will continue his education and preparation for service to the church as a called worker. Hear what the Word of God says about those who serve in the church. 2 Corinthians 6, working together with him, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listen to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. 1 Peter 4. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another, as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Practice these things. Devote yourself to them, so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing you will save both yourself and your hearers. Colossians 3. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Alex, are you prepared to serve as vicar in this congregation under the supervision of the pastor, undertaking your assignments as one who seeks training for the office of the Holy Ministry? If so, then answer, I am with the help of God. I am with the help of God. Alex Hinojosa, I install you as vicar at Zion Evangelical Lutheran Church in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Father, you send laborers into your harvest. Grant your blessing to Alex, who now begins his vicarage in our congregation, so that your word may bear much fruit for the growth of your church. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Go in the name of the Lord, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord... Your labor is not in vain. The Almighty and most merciful God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. We continue now with the prayer of the church as Vicar Hinojosa leads us in prayer and we stand. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, Amen. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we offer before you our common supplications for the well-being of your church throughout the world. So guide and govern it by your Holy Spirit, that all who profess themselves Christians may be led into the way of truth and hold the faith in unity of spirit, in the bond of peace, and in the righteousness of life. Send down upon all ministers of the gospel and upon the congregations committed to their care the healthful spirit 
of your grace, that you may please you in all things. Behold, in mercy, all who are in authority over us. Supply them with your blessing, that they may be inclined to your will and walk according to your commandments. We humbly ask your abiding presence in every situation that you would make known your ways among us. Preserve those who travel, satisfy the wants of your creatures, and help those who call upon you in any need, that they may have patience in the midst of suffering and according to your will, to be released from their afflictions, especially Dean, George, and Keith. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, our God, in holy baptism, you have called us to be Christians and granted us the remission of sins. Make us ready to receive the most holy body and blood of Christ for the forgiveness of all our sins. And grant us grateful hearts that we may give thanks to you, O Father, to your Son and to the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. We stand for the service of the sacrament on page 208. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you. O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment, you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve who ate the forbidden fruit, and you justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy, 
You promised salvation by a second Adam. Your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit, that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do, in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you, for the forgiveness of sins. This do, as oft as you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
Let us, let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.